Warning, this guide features week one strats for P10S. While the information in this video should be accurate enough to get you a kill, more optimized strats are almost certain to be discovered in the following weeks if they haven't already. Make sure to check the description below for links to any newer, better strats. Hi guys, and welcome to a Hector Lecture Guide to the fight P10S. This is Pandemonium. Pretty sure I pronounced that one correct this time. For this fight, you need spread positions. Tanks and melee should be on the outside platforms and healer and range spread on the inside. These spreads need to be far enough apart that you don't overlap with these pretty large web AoEs, nor do you overlap any of the pillars on the arena. There are pillars on either side of the middle of the poison puddles, and also one in the bottom left and in the bottom right of the arena. There's two sets of towers. The 3-3-2 pattern should have tanks and melees within melee range, while healers in range take the other spots. And the second set has four towers in the front and back. You should have tanks and melees in the front, healers in range in the back. The exact spread doesn't matter. There's also a mechanic that has lasers, and you need an agreed-upon laser order. This guide will show MRHT for melee range healer tank, but the only thing that matters is having melees first, tanks last. Finally, my guide's going to be showing the one-tile version of spreads. For this, this has every player spread over on the far left platform. Tanks and healers are left, DPS are right. When they need to do partners, they just slide horizontally. And when they need to do roll stacks, they just collapse together vertically. Note that currently in Party Finder, you will find plenty of groups that still do this on separate platforms and separate spreads and stacks, depending on if you need to be in groups for when you have partner stacks, or if you need to be tank healers left, DPS right for when you have roll stacks. This is also totally fine, totally valid. I'm just not going to show it in my guide because it's not what I personally did. The boss starts by casting Ultima. This is a raid wide that comes with everybody's favorite, a bleed. After Ultima is Soul Grasp. This is a tank buster that targets the top player in aggro for a dual tank buster. Overall, Soul Grasp hits for four hits, pop some light cooldowns, and share this. You can also have the main tank take it just with Invuln. Next up, the boss cast Dividing Wings and loosely spread with tank sealers on the left, DPS on the right. Two staves are going to appear in the middle of the arena. When the boss casts Steel Web, a random support and a random DPS will each be tethered to one of the scepters. Which one you're tethered to is random. Another support and another DPS will get one of these stacking web markers. Use the way marks that I've positioned here to make this easy for you. The players with the tether should go to the one and the two, whichever marker is on the side you're tethered to. The support with the stack should go to the three marker, and the DPS with the stack should go to the four marker. If positioned correctly, everybody should look like this. The other players that don't have anything need to be within the web, and they need to be stacked at the edge of those web AoEs. It's going to cause problems if you're too close, which I'll describe in a second. If everybody's in the right spot, the cleaves go off, they're very wide. The players that are cleaved by the tethers are going to have a bleed, while the players that were in the stack are going to be webbed together. This is why we had to be at the edge of the AoEs, because if you were too close together, the webs that you have between you would turn pink and are unbreakable. Note that the webbed players have one of these debuffs here that's slowly increasing over time. If it gets to five stacks and they haven't been broken free yet, they're going to die. To break them free, simply have the players who took the cleaves run through the webs. These can be a little bit finicky, but if you run through them clearly, they should break. Now look out for an in-out mix-up. Circles of Pandemonium means that you dodge to the inside. If instead you got Pandemones Holy, it's an out. This matches up almost perfectly with the boss's hitbox. Next up, the boss will cast Wicked Step, these are the tank buster towers you've seen in normal mode, but with an extra fun twist. Here, the tanks need to position on the northern inner diagonal. Here's a little zoom in on it. The idea is that you need to be slightly north of the middle of the tower, on the inside, and closer to the east-west line than to the north-south line. If you position correctly within your tower, when the boss hits for the tank buster, you're going to get sent flying and will land on the outside platforms. Note that this is both a tank buster and comes with a bleed, so mitigate it to reduce the damage of both the initial hit and the bleed. Afterwards, have your healers drift left and your DPS drift right for entangling web. Both tanks, a random healer, and a random DPS are targeted with these AoEs that are going to drop puddles at the end. They need to go together to make a bridge. You're only going to be able to make a bridge if your AoEs overlap, so make sure you're very close to the edge. As soon as the puddles appear, dodge out of them as they hit for damage two seconds later, and then tanks can immediately cross the bridge. You'll need to, because next up is Pandemoniac Pillars. Hop inside your pre-assigned towers, and now get ready to try to find a safe spot to dodge into. This can be tricky. Here's how it works. The back row is always unsafe because the adds that drop always shoot lasers. 
The boss is also casting circles or holy, so get in or out respectively. At each of the towers, you're going to get another ad spawning. The ads that have the halo above them, like you see in the top left, these shoot out lasers and are going to do the donut AoE you may have recognized from normal mode. This means that directly under them is a safe spot. The ones that have the spikes instead shoot chains into the ground. These are going to make point blank AoEs appear underneath them, so you need to be slightly to the corner of them. Either is capable of acting as a safe spot, just read the attacks themselves, dodge the inner out from the main boss, and find yourself a place to stand. I'll slow this down so you can see how the AoEs overlap to see roughly what these safe spots look like. Next up, the boss casts Silk Spit and go to your pre-assigned spread positions, making sure to go across the bridge so you don't get yourself a 40 second poison debuff. Make sure you're spread out properly, and just as these finish, the boss is going to cast Daemoniac Bonds, and I need to have the party list over on the side because you need to see what debuffs you get. You're going to get a mix of three debuffs. This debuff means spread away from everyone else, this debuff means partner up with one other person, and this debuff means that you need to be in roll stacks, so four people. The partners will always target either all supports or all DPS, so you just have a support partner with a DPS. The roll stacks always target one random support and one random DPS, so you have all the supports collapsed together and all the DPS collapsed together. Which of the two debuffs you get and the order you get them in will be random for this first set of bonds. Before we worry about that, first is Pandemoniac Meltdown. This is a line stack, but two players are targeted with spread line AoEs. They should not join the stack, preferably one to the left, one to the right, though you can fit two to the left as their AoEs are much smaller. Afterwards, start heading towards your assigned positions for how you're going to spread for your debuffs. You need to get off the main platform because the boss is catching touchdown, so the whole main platform will be unsafe during the debuffs. If you haven't yet, look at your debuffs to check which one's first. In this case, we have partners going off first, so the groups will partner up, followed by spreads. As soon as your partner debuff reaches zero, you can start to spread. The partners will go off and spread to the far left and right edge of that platform to be able to avoid overlapping for these. Just to show you what this would have looked like if instead we'd had the roll stacks, just smush together vertically, and then as soon as the roll stacks go off, spread back towards your spread positions. However you deal with that, the boss is going to cast an Ultima Raid Wide, followed by a Soul Grasp Tank Buster. We get another set of Demoniac Bonds. This will always be spreads and partners, but the order is random. Head to your other tower positions, the tanks melees in the front and the healer's range in the back, for pandemoniac turrets. You're going to get some numbers appearing above each of these ads that's just fallen down, and this is where that order that we discussed at the beginning is really important, in this case, MRHT. Let's break down how this mechanic works, as it's probably the trickiest in the fight. One at a time, in number order, these ads are going to activate. Their hitboxes become visible, and they start aiming a laser at the nearest player. That player can turn these ads. When the laser goes off, every player hit gets knocked back. The nearest player, when the laser went off, will receive one of these debuffs here, meaning they can not be in any additional lasers or the damage will instantly kill them. Additionally, the damage from the lasers is shared amongst every player in it. The only player that can feasibly take one of these lasers by themselves is a tank. Every other player needs at least one other player with them to help them to survive. So if a simple way of doing this could be have an entire light party in front of the one with the melee closest, and every time you're hit and get the debuff, you just peel off and you don't take the next laser. Range closest on the second, healer closest on the third, and tank closest on the fourth. This unfortunately leads to a lot of extra movement, so I don't recommend this version. Instead, the version I'll show is what's sometimes referred to as 2221. The only additional player in every stack is the tank. So the first one is just the melee and the tank. The melee peels off and the range steps in front. The tank moves across and the healer is nearest. And for the fourth hit, the tank takes it by themselves. This hurts, so at least use a short cooldown, if not a long and a short. Now let's look at how this all looks together. Group one will always take the leftmost of the number that they need to take. Group two will always take the rightmost of the number they need to take. First ones activate, melees are in front, and the melees and tanks ride it together. Melees are going to dodge this laser while range step in front. Tanks slide over, and melees and range are all on the outside. Note the melees are starting to move forward, and the range are starting to move backwards, because we have to deal with our spreads and partners at the end, and we want to have tanks and melees end up near the front, healers and range end up near the back. Third laser, healers take it in the front. And now everybody's on the outside except for the tanks who take this one alone. Now we resolve our debuffs, 
It's spread first this time, followed by partners. Just to rewind a bit, the pattern we just saw was the one where it was the outside first followed by inner lasers. You can also get inside first followed by outer lasers. And if you're unlucky, the dreaded cursed pattern. This pattern's so tricky because you'll notice the ones are not opposite twos, the threes are not opposite fours. We're gonna have to aim at least one of the lasers diagonally. Let me show you what this looks like. The ordering and assignment of turrets is exactly the same. You have the group one taking the furthest left, group two taking the furthest right. At the beginning, melees in front, tanks behind, take the first one perfectly vertically. Your ranged are already in position, ready to bait the number twos correctly. Tanks pop sprint and slide over to get behind your ranged and take this vertically as well. Healers need to be out of the way. They can't wait in front of their three for this one. Healers immediately are going to slide over in front of the number threes. Note that tanks might actually be the ones aiming these lasers because of how the aiming snapshots, but as long as the healers are the nearest player, they get the debuff and everything's fine. We aim this diagonally because of how the turrets snapshot they're aiming. If you don't aim this one diagonally, sometimes the nearest tank might accidentally end up baiting both of the turrets. If that happens, they take both of them and they're going to die. Assuming you've aimed this correctly, everybody get out of the way of the last set of turrets. We're going to fire these lasers vertically, and then at the very end, resolve your debuffs. Spreads here, followed by partners. The boss will follow this with Pandemoniac Ray, dodge away from the unsafe side. In Savage Mode, this spawns a couple of glowing orbs. These are going to make horizontal AoEs, so just don't be in line with them. We get another Ultima Raid Wide, another Soul Grass Tank Buster, and we get another Wicked Step set of Tank Buster Towers. Deal with these exactly the same way as we did before. There's another Entangling Web, and we need to make our bridges. Once again, nothing's changed here. Healer going left, DPS going right. Dodge the puddles. This time, tanks don't need to go across their bridge because this is followed with Silk Spit. Go to your spread positions. I wouldn't recommend having main tank and off tank swap here. Just stay and go to the tank spot on your side. As Silk Spit's about to resolve, Demoniac Bonds is going to give debuffs. This will always be spreads and roll stacks, but the order is random. Immediately head towards your pillar locations. Note, while tanks and melees are going to have a tight timing to get here, I'd recommend saving sprint if you can. There's more than enough time to get it without sprint, and sprint's really useful for the mechanic immediately after this. Soak your towers. Head to middle. Look at the boss's cast to see if you're in or out, in this case out. And find a safe spot based on where the adds are. As soon as you dodge this, you should hopefully have already taken note of what debuff order you have. In this case, it's spread first, then roll stacks. The group are going to roughly start to do their spread positions that they did for debuffs back on the left platform, but they're going to do them in the middle. The boss will cast Pandemoniac Ray, and everybody's going to slide over towards the safe side. Spread out, and as soon as that debuff resolves, immediately collapse vertically, making sure you're in a safe lane, watching out for the golden orbs. Here's just what it looks like if you have the reverse order. Here the groups have stacks first, so they're in their stack groups already when the Pandemoniac Ray happens, and they just slide over to the safe side. And now they're going to spread out vertically into their same spread spots. I recommend players on the far north and far south look for the furthest safe lane and take that one to give players in the middle more room to deal with theirs. When all said and done, you get a dividing wings, and tank healers and should be on the left, DPS on the right. Be near the bridges because these staffs are going to appear up on the far left and far right platform. Just like before, Steel Web's cast, a random support and a random DPS are tethered each to one of these staves. And we get a random stack marker on a random support, random DPS. We have to get out of middle because touchdown's being cast. This is real simple. Tank healers are going to stack at the front of the stave on the left, DPS on the right. Whoever's tethered to the stave, you just go to the one that you're tethered to and point it south. There's not really enough room to go horizontally with your webs here and still spread far enough, so I recommend forming a triangle. As soon as the cleave goes off, those players need to go break their players free by running through their webs. If you've dealt with all that, we've got a bunch of repeat mechanics for a bit. There's Pandemoniac Meltdown, there's a Soul Grasp, and now we get the final brand new mechanic here. This Dividing Wings is going to give you the same two staves that we've seen in the middle of the arena, 
but it's going to be combined with Pandemoniac Web, and we get a lot going on. So let's break it down. First off, we get two players getting tethered to the staves in the middle. Three players are going to get these AoEs that mean they're going to drop puddles, and one player is going to get a stack. Here's where everyone needs to go. The boss will always combine this with Pandemon's Holy, so no one can be in the hitbox. The players with the puddles head down to the A, B, and C, whichever one they're nearest to. It's why we were roughly spread out beforehand. The tethers are going to point them out on their side, due west and due east. The stack is going to go down to D, and the unmarked players are going to help to soak that stack. I don't recommend being in a perfectly horizontal line, as you risk getting clipped by the cleave if they're a little bit south, so just be slightly south of where the stack is positioned. If everyone's in the right spot, the cleaves will go off, we're going to get puddles appearing at A, B, and C, and if they're perfectly placed, what we should get is that they're overlapping the pillars at the bottom left and the bottom right, and we're going to get ourselves a little web connecting all of it across the bottom. The three players that were stacked are webbed together, and they have their own puddles to drop. We need to immediately break them free. Either the players who took the cleaves or the players that baited the first puddles can do that. And now they're going to go south, and they're going to go drop their puddles in almost the same spot. See, that little web thread that we've made, we don't want to break that, so be careful not to run through it. Just drop your puddles due north of that. Make sure that these puddles overlap the pillars in the bottom left and bottom right corner and are overlapping each other. If you've done everything correctly, this should reinforce the web at the bottom to make a web wall that will need to survive the final mechanic. The boss cast Demoniac Bond at this point in time, and we get a random assortment of the debuffs from earlier. Spreads and something else. Unlike every other mechanic where I've used the exact same spread spots, the exact same partner positions, the exact same roll stacks, I don't recommend using them for this one. The reason is that you, everybody for these debuffs, just before they go off, are going to get knocked into that web wall in the back. If you try to spread vertically, your tanks and melees are going to have a bit of a tough time trying to get all the way far enough spread out to the north. Instead, if you get yourselves the roll stack debuff, Use this like 30 seconds you have before everything goes off to have the tank healers to slightly to the left, the DPS slightly to the right, and use these roughly as your spreads. If instead you get the partner stacks, use the exact same positions you use when you go in the turret towers, the four in the front, four in the back. This will have it so that your tanks are next to melees, your healers are next to range, and will make partner stacks a little bit easier. This is us taking advantage of the fact that we can horizontally spread before the knockback to make the spreads easier. Now comes the fun one, Harrowing Hell. The name is apt. This is hell for healers. This is a insane heal check and mitigation check, harder than what's been in most fights before. What's going to happen here is the boss is going to hit for nine consecutive raid wads. The first eight hits are going to happen over 12 seconds, with a final hit coming with a knockback that happens 15 seconds after the initial cast. As a result of these being so spread out, you need to be careful with your mitigations because a lot of them will fall off by the time that the final hits happen. So spread them out. Have some at the start. Have some of them hit closer to the end. Note that Harrowing Hell is also wild charge, meaning that the closest two players are going to take higher damage than the rest of the group, so your tanks need to be in front just ever so slightly. Be aware that the tanks are going to take a lot of extra damage, so they should pop personal mitigations, and if possible, near the end of Harrowing Hell's set of raid wides, pop their invuln to make sure they survive and keep the party alive. Healers, make sure you're healing like crazy here. This is a great place to get value on things like Lilybell and Panheima, though don't waste them right at the beginning, as you want to make sure that you've got enough for when the AoEs get faster near the end. When you finally see the knockback arrows, you've got three seconds to spread out a little bit. Make sure everybody's healed up, shielded, and mitigated before you get knocked into the wall. You're stunned for about a second, and then you need to immediately get into positions for the first debuff. In this case, spread, followed by partners. After this, it's all easy street. Ultima raid wide, soul grasp tank buster, wicked test step tank buster towers, dealt with exactly the same way that we've described before, Entangling web to bait puddles to make bridges. And now tanks should come back after this one because we get what's, I guess, a new mechanic. It's parted plumes. It's the same thing from normal mode. Get out of middle. Look at where the first AoE spawns. Start behind that. The added difficulty level here is as it's resolving the boss cast Pandemoniac Ray. 
but you have time to just deal with parted plumes and then immediately get to the safe side afterwards. Watch out for orbs. Don't go too far north or south here because immediately after orbs, the boss casts either a circles or a holy and you need to get in or out. There's a silk spit spread to deal with. Pandemoniac pillars. A pandemoniac meltdown line AoE. And finally, the boss does its soft enrage, harrowing hell. This is the exact same damage and therefore the exact same pain to heal and mitigate through, but the knockback at the end is not possible to survive because you have no web wall to save you this time. I'd recommend throw your mitigation on, but focus more on killing the boss because from the start of the cast, you only have 15 seconds before it is a hard enrage. If you haven't killed the boss before the knockback happens, it's game over. That's everything you need to know for P10S. I hope you found this useful. Sorry this one went on a little bit long. I wanted to show a lot of different alternatives for how different mechanics could play out. And apologies if these are not the spread positions you prefer. I've tried to go with what I think will be the most sensible ones, but there's lots of different ways that this will work. Anyways, hope Party Finder treats you well for this fight. Good luck going for the kill. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.